you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank our two witnesses today for your um, engagement in implementing uh, the Biden administration's uh, global leadership uh, in pulling together our allies, uh, not just in Western Europe, but around the world, uh, in imposing real costs on uh, Putin and Putin's Russia for their brutal invasion of Ukraine. Um, I, forgive me, I was at another hearing. Uh, the Judiciary Committee is currently conducting a hearing on uh, how to hold accountable um, those Russians who are committing war crimes, um, atrocities uh, against Ukrainians. So I may have missed the exchange on this particular point. Are there additional economic sanctions that you are urging that we support or authorize or that the administration is considering um, that would impose significant and effective additional costs on Russia? And if so, what are they? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, there's two main themes that I uh, would like to address in answering your question. The first is a continuation of many of the sanctions on uh, targeting financial institutions and military entities or military industrial supply chains. That's critical in order to deny Russia revenue to fund its brutal war. Not only the U.S. imposition and enforcement of those measures, but also the parallel implementation and enforcement by our colleagues and counterparts in Europe and other jurisdictions that have uh, parallel measures. We have an opportunity for them to match us in certain of our measures and likewise. Great. Um, should we be considering revoking Russia's membership in institutions like the IMF or the World Bank? Um, that would be a, a significant and a bold step. I'd be interested in hearing your opinions on whether you know, further removing them from some of these multilateral international financial institutions would have some positive impact. Ms. Rosenberg and then Mr. O'Brien, if you may. Thank you for the question, Senator. This, uh, this question is relevant not just for financial institutions, but uh, other multilateral bodies in which Russia has membership. The principle that, um, if I may, the administration has sought to consider when evaluating each of these is uh, that Russia should be not denied the opportunity for decision making and leadership in forums where that is uh, unacceptable for it to continue to, to, to play a leadership role. The bylaws of different organizations and institutions uh, create different pathways here, whether excluding Russia entirely or depriving it of leadership and decision making. So it, it's different from institution to institution or multilateral body, but we're committed to uh, the principle that Russia should not be in the position to inform significant decision making or hold a veto over policy that other members and uh, would seek to advance. Let me ask you one more question briefly, and then I'll turn to Mr. O'Brien for both. Um, is Treasury looking seriously at using um, Russian asset seizures as a way to fund reconstruction efforts in Ukraine? Thank you for that question. This is a, a, a major priority uh, for this administration. I know many on the uh, here on the Hill are also focused on this, and I expect that uh, some of our Department of Justice colleagues um, may have had the chance to share with you some of their preliminary thinking on this matter. Uh, the administration did send a um, uh, suggested legislation up to the Hill earlier this year. It was not included in a supplementary uh, legislative package, but this is an area we'd like to focus on further with all of you. The concept of restitution here is key for many of us, the mode and mechanism uh, uh, requires some detailed work, including with our allies. Mr. O'Brien, if you might, um, I'd be interested in your views on the consequences for our relationships uh, for us to both impose additional secondary sanctions or enforce secondary sanctions against nations that we otherwise uh, have good relationships with uh, for their ongoing uh, business dealings with Russia. Um, just hypothetically, uh, Turkey, uh, the UAE, uh, India, uh, what would the consequences be of our trying to actually carry out the things Ms. Rosenberg's talking about, driving the Russians out of positions of leadership and responsibility in multilateral financial institutions, actually enforcing secondary sanctions, seizing assets, and using them for reconstruction? Well, I think the point, Senator, is we have many tools to get countries into compliance with sanctions. Many of the countries actually want to be part of the rule-abiding club or at least have access to our economies. And that gives us enormous leverage through the, the prospect of financial sanctions, designations, export controls, et cetera. So in each of those situations, and I'd say in a number of other countries that have different relationships with Russia, we find ourselves in active conversations about how they can retool their economies to not be completely dependent on Russia, 
how they can um, develop the mechanisms needed to enforce the sanctions and comply with them. And then throughout that process, while we're working with governments, the uh, private sectors are well aware of what will make them vulnerable to sanctions. So we do see, and then I'll close with this point, as we mentioned in a particular co uh, conversation earlier, sometimes if we designate the Russian counterparty, then that causes the uh, institutions in some of those countries to say they can no longer continue working in an area. So we don't necessarily have to employ these tools against the friendly countries, but we're able to achieve the same result in other ways. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank you both uh, for your testimony and for your work uh, and to recognize the administration's success so far in uh, pulling together a very wide range of very disparate uh, partners, um, but also urge you to, to sharpen and focus this work because of the urgency of uh, imposing greater costs uh, on Putin's Russia for their aggression in Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.